you know, Friday, it was just kind of like a quiet night. And then a week later, it's like tanks on the street, and like <laughs> the bullets flying everywhere. <laughs> like, what is going on right now? This episode, Living Through a Revolution, Having the Courage to Change Careers, and the Primacy of Relationships. I'm Daniel Lance, along with co-host Paul Gilman, and from Paul's Basement Studios, this is Podso One. Yanni Katsaros is a one of a kind. Born in Athens, Greece, his family moved to Cairo, Egypt when he was five years old. He and I met when I moved to Cairo for high school in 2008, and in early 2011, we experienced the beginnings of unrest and were evacuated due to what eventually evolved into a revolution. Yanni and I discuss our memories of that time, and he shares his journey in the ensuing decade, including getting married and completely changing the course of his career. Just a note, I called him Giannis in high school and in this episode, but I've since learned he now goes by the true Greek pronunciation Yanni. So here's Yanni. Let's get started. Uh, Alrighty. Mr. Giannis Katsaros. Uh, hello, my show. friends. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining, man. Um, Absolutely. Giannis, you're, you and I go back, go all the way back to high school. So yeah. it's, it's truly a, a pleasure to have you on. Um, oh, it's my honor being here. It's really so cool. It's my first time. On a, on a podcast? On a podcast, yeah. All right, man. Well, we're in the big league, so get ready to be famous. All righty. I'm excited. Where are you right now? So I live in San Antonio, Texas with Antonio, my wife. Texas. I just got married this summer or I guess almost last summer. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so how has San Antonio um, been affected by COVID-19? I think it's, I mean, very similar to how other cities in, in Texas are kind of responding to it. Actually, I've, I've seen a lot of um, kind of the firsthand uh, things that th- people are thinking about because my wife works at a hospital. She's a speech pathologist, so she's not she's not like on the front lines dealing with patients like nurses or doctors would be, but she still does see um, you know patients and such. And so she's she's there every day and having to kind of think about all these things and how to stay safe. Uh, they have all these regulations in the hospital right now, so I think I think we're finally at the point where, of course, people are taking it seriously and um, like recognizing it for for how dangerous it is. So do you like how often do you leave the house uh <laughs> at this point pretty much i mean never like the i went to uh you know maybe once a week i'll go to the grocery store i'll try to stay i mean i can do all my work from home i'm, I'm working from home uh remotely and just getting all my work done i think we might go on like a walk or something on a trail usually they're pretty empty like there's no people around uh so you know just to kind of get outdoors a little bit but mm. otherwise trying to stay home and just you know not be around too many people social distancing right nice and, and you just got a couple of uh of little critters didn't you yeah we just got two puppers did um, you know that you'd be working at home every day when you first got them no definitely did not we got them in i think in january is when we got them so it was still you know you know as crazy as it is now yeah um, at least in the u.s so it's been good though, staying at home with them and kind of having them as entertainment in between Zoom calls and programming and you know and whatnot. So and they they drive me nuts sometimes, but it's it's all right. Yeah, it's it's good to have each other too. Um, yeah. Wh- where's your uh, is your where's your family in the world right now? So my family's actually they're back in Cairo. Um, they were in so like like you mentioned, you and I, you know, we grew up together. We had some technical difficulties and the call broke up here, but this is where Yanni explains that his parents moved from Greece to Cairo when he was in the first grade and enrolled him in CAC, the K-12 through school, which stands for Cairo American College. They moved back to Greece in 2015. So since then, my dad's kind of been, he's been working in Cairo, but kind of rotating back and forth to Greece where my brothers and my mom were at. But now as of, as of, you know, the summer where I just got married, they moved back to Cairo and they've been there full time. So it's just my youngest brother, my mom and my dad. And so they're, they're in lockdown over there. Oh yeah. So you can imagine what it's like with, uh, 
you know, with the <laughs> coronavirus stuff and going to chemo market and everything is just gross as usual. It's, you've got, <laughs> you've got the helpful people, uh, you know, wiping stuff down and there. <laughs> No it's way. It's very safe. No problem. No, no <laughs> worry. No worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. So, you're, okay. So your family is still there. They are. Yeah. Um, so are, are they, are they like stuck at home as well? Like how is Cairo reacting to it? Um, yeah. The, so the school has gone to virtual learning. So my brother's at home. My mom's at home as well. So CAC is now like virtual learning. Which That's right. You and I, we had to do. Uh, a semester of virtual learning back in 2011. That's right. Um, yeah. That's the, the first spring. thing I remembered um, during that time. So I was like, you know, this, this, the craziness feels familiar in some way, which mm-hmm. is keeping me grounded. Definitely a very, to me, this feels a lot calmer, but it's cause I'm home, you know, not really doing anything back when, back when we were going through that, it was like, you know, Friday, it was just kind of like a, quiet night and then a week later it's like tanks on the street and like <laughs> the bullets flying everywhere <laughs> like what is going on right now you know barricading yeah, really our good. apartment door with uh bookcases and having baseball bats by the door so uh definitely Jeez. a crazy experience to recall. yeah and like having all the internet and telecommunications turned off one day yeah that was that was crazy that was i mean like and and, and what's interesting is i remember like you and i both lived through that kind of in, in parallel so I, i'd be interested to hear like how you recall some of those events and the progression of that because um you know when i tell the story to friends and stuff they always ask me kind of like so at what point did you know like things were getting crazy and it was i think it was a matter of it was all of these events that were taking place within a week but like you said like first it was just all right you know it's police day the next day let's you know stay inside and don't go out today okay no big deal the next day, it's like, oh, there's, there's been a huge protest at Tahrir Square, and now they're calling for the Million Man March the next day. You know, fast forward two days later, it's like they've opened up the prisons and let all the prisoners out. And like, that's when I was like, okay, this is this is definitely serious. This isn't something that's uh that's you know very very common to see. Um, yeah. So the way I remember it, it like it, it yeah. felt like everybody was trying to hold on to whatever was normal like yeah no matter what was going on i was like still going to school still doing this still doing that and then yeah it was like the course of a couple of days when everyone was like this is real and this is happening uh and i remember i think we were both at the airport at the same time weren't we like weren't we all like just everyone was waiting for that one plane because they (laughs) (laughs) i remember that happening because it was like the at this point all airlines had like you know, gotten everyone out of there. They're like, all right, get all our planes out of Egyptian airspace. Like, get everyone out, except that one airline, <laughs> Memphis Air. Remember them? <laughs> Memphis Air, dude. <laughs> well, oh, yeah. make a lot of money today. <laughs> so they chartered the plane to like five companies, to so the embassy, like Shell, BP, Apache, just everyone. Um, yep. So that was, uh, I remember sitting at the airport for like, 22 hours 23 hours waiting for that charter plane to take us to italy so and they then it took you guys to did it take you guys to london or what you you left as well right yeah no we left on the 28th of so january 25th is egypt's independence day um which is also my mom's birthday which is how i remember it oh wow yeah that must have been a crazy birthday Um, great birthday weekend for her No, but I think it was like a few days after that. I remember January 28th was, I think, what they call like the Friday of Wrath or the mm. Friday of Rage. Uh, if it was a Friday, I could, my dates could be off. Yeah. But I remember that it was the 28th. That was the day that, that like got the U.S. Embassy to say like, you need to get all the Americans out of Cairo. Yeah. And then <clears throat> all the oil and gas companies and uh, they mobilized and tried to charter the same plane to get their people out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, dude, it was great. I mean, like, we, like it was a three day span of us actually being in Cairo. So it was like uncertain and a little hectic for a minute, but I don't think I really ever felt unsafe, uh, which yeah. I feel really fortunate about. No, for sure. And I don't know if that was like, I mean, we weren't young, but we were still like, we were in high school. I was in 10th grade. You were in 11th grade at the time. And, um, I just remember the, the, like you said, it, you didn't feel 
like it was uh, dangerous, but it just it was a very unique situation. It was almost like it took you a couple took a couple of months after to kind of realize what we went through and to say, you know, like, wow, this was, this was something very special. Um, I mean, especially for the people that were trying to stage a revolution. So really yeah. cool living through that for sure. It was awesome. And, and I remember the, the first anniversary of January 25th, it was like my senior year, your junior year and everyone went nuts. Yeah. Uh, Cause it was like their independence day. I think that was what I, what I associate with the peak of like morale in Cairo mm-hmm. was January 25th of 2012. It seems like ever since then, it's just been depressing to follow. Uh, Cause it's yeah. like, you know, military takeover and then somebody else takes over and then somebody else. And yeah. the, <clears throat> the people's freedom just gets more and more eroded. And It's kind of back to square one, but things are worse than before, you know? And it's, it's sad because, these people were uprising because they wanted change. Um, and it's a, you know, of course, I'm, I'm no political scientist or anything to, to comment you know, on the depths of the situation. But, you know, we both lived through it and saw it. And so, you know, uh, so Sisi now, um, who I believe is the president, right? Um, I don't know. He, I believe he was from Mubarak's regime. And so that in-between period, so it was like, uh, you have Mubarak, um, and then after that, it was, was it Morsi, right? I think it was Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood. And then after that period, you know, then it was like, they were like, you know, we're not happy. This isn't what we wanted. And a lot more strife. And this time around, you know, the, the second time around two years later or so where they tried to over, where they eventually overthrew Morsi. That was, I wasn't actually there for that. I had graduated uh, that summer. So that was 2013. Cause I remember my dad was in Egypt and that time around, you know, the protests turned into riots and some of them got violent. And Morsi has said, you know, I'm not stepping down. You elected me. So, I mean, it's um, like you said that that 2012, January 25th, like you said, is at least for us, we remember that as it's kind of the peak of the morale. And since then, it's been tough seeing how things have progressed. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah the, and it's I haven't just... been back since 2015. So I haven't been, you know, able to go visit. Um, I feel like if we went back, it would be unrecognizable, like physically, you know, we would recognize it and we'd still know what like road nine is and be able to go to like yep. Saudi market and like that weird little shell classics. station. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's and right then, where like, I lived. Chipo Tamea. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> all that good stuff. We would all be able to like see those places, but I just think like the feeling and the, uh, yeah, it's a different, different vibe to it for sure. Yeah, I think it's completely different. It, it would it would feel like a completely different place going back. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> you uh, were a Greek living in Cairo at the time. Let's go back in time a little bit farther. Like, where were you born and, like, trace your path from that to sophomore year at Cairo? So I was born in, um, in Athens, Greece, and I lived there for about two, three years or so. Um, no, maybe longer, maybe five or six years. Um, and I moved to Cairo in, yes, yeah, so it was five years. I moved to Cairo in 2000 and I actually hadn't, didn't really speak English. I just, I had taken a couple classes and such. And so I just remember like my very first day at, at CAC, you know, at the, at the school there, it was like little first grade Yanni doesn't speak English. And it's like, this cool huge playground and I was just like playing and then all of a sudden all the kids were gone and I was like oh, I wonder where everyone went and I just kind of like ended up strolling to class finding my way eventually the teacher was like you know like, why are you late I'm like, ah, I, don't, I don't know <laughs> so, so I was in ESL for like I want to say six months um, which definitely helped a lot because and I was young enough to to learn English well and so now of course it's my first primary language I still speak Greek uh, with my parents and my brothers, but definitely takes practice to not forget it. And um, so I try my best, but dude, you sound a hundred percent native. My, my primary language at this point, I think it's cause I started that young. Uh, it was, I was like five or six when I started learning. So, and uh, so yeah, I, I lived in, in Cairo all the way through pretty much to 2011 when we just talked about with the revolution happening and I don't know about you, but when, when I went to 
uh, when we evacuated, they actually took us to Houston because that's where uh, Apache, their headquarters uh, are at. So they actually did a really good job of kind of relocating us there, getting us into like a uh, rental house, getting us a rental car and just taking care of everything and even getting us into a school. And so I attended Houston Christian High School for three months. Um, I definitely, you know, I look back on some parts of that fondly. Other parts, I just remember like just not being happy. But I think it was just the overall situation of all of a sudden all our friends, you know, we're all apart. Uh, my dad actually had to go back. And so he was in Cairo working uh, with a very kind of small crew of people that had to go back. And so it was just my mom and my brothers. So it was a lot. It was a lot on her um, during that time, but definitely a, a good experience. I, you know, a lot happened during that time and then returned back to Cairo um, and graduated in 2013. So it's kind nice. of a quick over. I don't know if you want to go into depth on anything else. Um, no, that that's great. So really most of your childhood was spent in, uh, in Cairo. Um, yeah. Do you like, when you tell people where you're from, I'm guessing you say Greece, but like, do you feel like Egyptian at all just from having lived there for I'd so say, long? No, I definitely, you know, I say I'm from Greece, but I grew up in Egypt and, um, I, you know, it'd be great if I spoke some Arabic to feel a little bit more musty, but, uh, but I don't. So, I mean, uh, interestingly, a lot of my, some of my closest friends in college, uh, you know, one's from Lebanon, one's from the UAE. Um, and so, I definitely kind of carried that through with me in college when two of my closest friends are, you know, from the Middle East. And so um, I think of Egypt very fondly and I love it and I love the people and just really good memories there. So yeah. definitely a huge part of, of me and my childhood. Yeah. And you have the, you might not have the Arabic language, but you have the accent nailed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that go. is true. So Yas, when you were like 10, 11, 12, how did you spend your, uh, your free time when you weren't at school and you weren't hanging out with your parents? That's a good question. I, I think thinking back on that, I remember that I love to do just a variety of things. The biggest play being playing music. Uh, like Daniel mentioned, I was just obsessed with playing the drums. Um, and I just, I love to play sports too. So I would do that a lot with my friends and um, you know, Daniel will tell you, but like in Madi, there wasn't like, a, there was tons to do, but not like in the same sense that you would as a kid, growing up in the u.s so we actually spent a lot of time like at the school on weekends because it was just kind of like a almost like a community uh area that you could think of you know we've got the basketball courts and the swimming pools and such so we'd go and play sports and and music that was a lot of what i did on weekends of course you know video games and uh hanging out with friends so um that was kind of the bulk of what i really enjoyed doing um, so you, you went to undergrad at University of Tulsa, you studied petroleum engineering and you, you went down that, like the, the career path of becoming a petroleum engineer. Yeah. And how did that land you in the middle of nowhere in Midland, Texas? So I interned twice actually with Apache, um, once, uh, after my sophomore year and once after my junior year. And the first one was in the field. It's kind of a standard, uh, thing that companies do, or at least, you know, they, they did when I was doing it, that they want you to get field experience, kind of seeing what's happening out there, whether it's on the production side or the drilling side, they want you to see how things happen in practice because you learn a lot of theory, you learn a lot of math and stuff in college, but the application of it seems to be uh, very operations and kind of project management based. And there's a lot of terminology and such. And so that was kind of the first glimpse of like, okay, this is part of it. This is part of the job. I don't really like it, but I, I like the scientific side. So, you know, I can just hold off and do that. So I had my first internship in the field in three for working for three months in Hobbs, New Mexico, and I actually had some, you know, really great friendships that came out of that. I, I made a really, really close friend who uh, actually recently passed away, which is, which has been, um, you know, difficult to think about but it was it's really cool to think back to that time where again it was kind of a struggle for me i didn't really want to be out there but something really good came out of that which was that friendship with this guy uh, and, and his wife and his family so um yeah it's a little tangent there but yeah going I mean, back to feel the free if you want to if you want to talk about him well no, i mean he was just he was a really great guy he was kind of assigned to me almost as a as a mentor 
and he had a really interesting story uh, just, just to who he was. And um, he was essentially a, an ex felon, like, a, you know, he had a few felonies that he had in his past and just very dark past. And, you know, he, he would tell everyone, you know, he um, turned all of that around when uh, he came to Christ. And so he said that that, that kind of drove him to turn his life around. And so when I first met him, I was like, kind of skeptical because, you know, you, you kind of hear that sometimes and you're, you're not sure, but so I was kind of, I kind of had my, um, you know, kind of had my guard up around him, but that quickly went away because he was just the most genuine, most, you know, caring, helpful person that I, that I met out there. And he was just a fantastic mentor and, and friend. So that was a really nice, you know, like, you know, we got to hang out outside of work and he would take me with his wife to, you know, like the Lee County state fair and stuff and like the Lee County rodeo. So it was kind of interesting exploring that, uh, West Texas life with someone from there. And so, um, definitely a lot of really cool kind of experiences and blessings that came out of that, even though I didn't really end up uh, in the oil and gas, uh, space. And so, but, right. um, yeah. And he actually, I, th- I mentioned that he passed away. He had, uh, he was diagnosed with, with cancer about a year or so ago. Um, and he was, you know, he was just battling through that. And so he, he passed away, um, right before Christmas. So yeah, it's been, it was tough. Cause I, I felt like I didn't have a chance to really go, go back and say bye, which has kind of sometimes weighed heavy on me because he actually drove all the way down from um, Hobbs, New Mexico to Tulsa just for my graduation for that weekend with his wife. No way. And they drove back. Yeah, it was, it was really cool. And um, I think it was just, it weighs heavy on me because I mean, I, I went and saw him, um, you know, two or three times when he was getting treatment at MD Anderson in Houston. So it was really nice getting to, to see him there and, and just talk to him and spend time with him and his wife. But I think at the end of the day, I was, uh, somewhat in denial that now he's going to get better and you know I don't need to make a trip out to the hub just to you know I'm gonna I'll see him again soon um so yeah that's been it's been an interesting I don't know you just experience to to think about it and, and you know yeah that's rough man thanks for sharing though yep and so and- I mean just think back to like like I said all the really good memories with him and that just that great friendship that came out of that summer so The name of Yanni's mentor was Anthony Brewer. He died on December 3rd, 2019 at the age of 49. So you really, you you found like relationships that you treasured from that experience, but like the job itself, you kind of started to realize wasn't really jiving with your passion. Yeah, for sure. That was, and that was ultimately it. You know, I, I had done, I done my field internship. I came and did an office internship, which I thought I would enjoy a lot more, but I actually ended up hating it a lot more. <laughs> um, but um, funny enough, it's it's interesting kind of saying it out loud now, thinking about all these things, all these really cool friendships came out of that. Because in the second time around, um, I met a really cool guy who we ended up becoming you know really close friends with. And he was actually at my wedding party. And so like, that friendship started there when I was in that second internship in Houston. Um, and so I think I, you know, like I said, I look back on all those times very fondly. And I think a huge part of that is the people that I've met and those relationships. And so, um, you know, this buddy, his name is Matt and him and I worked together, uh, at Apache actually here in San Antonio and he actually still lives here in San Antonio. So you know, we're both really close. And I think I mentioned he was in my wedding party. I don't know if you caught that. Yeah, I caught that. So, and, and he's actually uh, kind of working to go down a similar route with like the data science stuff right now. So it's interesting seeing that. Um, I think there's no surprise there just because we're, we have, we share a ton of interests. Like he loves to work out. He loves, you know, the nerdy stuff that I do as well. So uh, <laughs> definitely a lot in common there. Um, but and he was very encouraging actually with with all of this in my transition through you know that summer of 2016 fast forward now 2020 that's you know 4 years later i'd say that this whole thing this transition has been kind of slowly but 4 years in the making um just to kind of like continue 
pouring the time into learning these things and trying to hone my skills and learn stuff and apply it at work. And then finally try to, you know, take that chance to, to break into the new, into a new field. So, so do you ever, do you ever have issues with motivation? Like, do you ever just like not want to do anything? I think it's important, you know, to realize that everyone's willpower is finite and it's, it's like a muscle, you know, you, you exercise your willpower every day. And at the end of the day, it's like you, you have very little, you know, willpower left. And so it's, it's totally natural that you see people like you come home and you're like, you know what, I just want to, you know, just relax and watch TV and not do, do something. But, um, I think the important thing is to think about what you're really passionate about and if the sacrifice is really worth it and then getting in the habit of doing that. So it's kind of a combination of recognizing that, this is something I really enjoy. You know, I don't feel like doing it right now. I've kind of gone through this cycle right now with uh, the class I'm taking. I'm I'm enjoying the class. It's just like, it's definitely a huge time commitment and there's, you know, I've got to do homework and read and it's just like, I just don't feel like doing it right now. Well, you know, I have to, I have deadlines and stuff to do. So that's definitely a motivating factor there, but I just try to take a step back and think like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm doing this masters because I enjoy this stuff. And ultimately this is the chance to, to dive in and learn. And sometimes that, that's challenging and it's hard. It's not going to be an easy thing. Um, but I, I think the, this kind of a struggle and the sacrifice will be worth it. Cause I, I just love that feeling of, you know, success and, and, and finishing something through. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that kind of went, that was a roundabout way no, of that answering great. that, but those are kind of my thoughts on that with motivation and yeah well because my first reaction to to you in general because like you know you're doing the masters at night and you have the full-time job and you're consulting on the side and like you're trying to change trying. careers and like <laughs> you're doing all this stuff and my first reaction is like why haven't you burned out three times already and it sounds like you know a combination of knowing yourself and and slowly building habits so that you don't yeah. have to think too much and you don't have to burn yourself out I think it's a combo of that. Like you said, it's, um, I, I read the, the book, the power of habits. I forget who it's by Charles Duhigg. I, you might have to correct me on that one, but that was a really, uh, interesting book talking about just how powerful <laughs> habits can be. And if you just get yourself into the habit of doing something, it becomes second nature. And so you can kind of use that to, to hack how you do stuff because even if you don't really feel like it, you've gotten in the habit of doing something and you've got kind of these triggers that happen when you're, you know, like when I step into the office uh, in this room that I'm in, I know that it's like, all right, I'm here to do work. And so it's not, it's not this effortful process of trying to, you know, force myself to work. I just like walk into the office and I'm like, all right, it's, it's time to work and do stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, likewise, you said, you know, how have you not burnt out? There are definitely times where I'm just like exhausted, but I try to use times like, you know, Christmas and summer and, um, you know, like spring break to really just, just like enjoy and indulge and not have to, you know, keep myself. Um, it, it's not like, I think I was telling you this, that there were times that I would feel bad for not doing something productive every second of the day. Like I'd even feel bad for listening to music in the car. Like, Oh, I should be listening to a podcast. I should be learning this. I should be learning that. And it's like that that's just unhealthy at that point. You know, you need to just give yourself time to rejuvenate and unwind and, you know, it's good to have these passions and, and, uh, the drive, but at the same time, you got to rest and relax and enjoy time with family and friends and, uh, and just, you know, hobbies and stuff that you do. Yeah. Yeah. There's a balance there for sure. So Giannis, let's go back to Cairo for a second. Sure. You play baseball for uh, CAC? Yes, I did. Yeah. So who did you play? Who were the uh, other schools that you played against? So this is interesting. It's a really good question. Um, we, we're the, pretty much the only American school there. And then we that had like a baseball team in Cairo. So most days we would probably like scrimmage against each other, but then we had one big game a week where we'd play essentially like military people, Marines, like people from the embassy, just anyone that was wanted to play baseball and that wanted to come play against our, you know, the local high school team from the community could sign up and be part of the scrubs team. And you'd be surprised. Like, some years the competition was crazy. Like they were, you know, we'd be happy if we won a game against the scrubs because you have some guy that, you know, played baseball in college and some other guy that played baseball in college and okay, this guy pitched this guy, you know, played first base, whatever. And you've got some really interestingly, some really good players that you'd come across. And so 
even though we were playing the same team pretty much every week, it was, uh, <laughs> it was good practice. And then we'd have uh, two tournaments a year, typically. One was like a Middle Eastern tournament where we'd go, you know, Doha or Kuwait, um, Dubai. And it was with kind of two different, uh, I guess, conferences, if you will. There's kind of the Middle Eastern conference that we're part of. We're also lucky enough to be part of like this European conference. And um, when we played against in that tournament, it was, you know, somewhere in Europe, like, you know, in Belgium or it was in London. Those are the two that I played while I was there. Um, you know, sometimes it could be in, in Paris or somewhere in Germany, but then you'd play other American high schools uh, in, in those, in those schools. So you'd have all these international schools come together over a weekend or three or four days, I forget. And you'd, kind of compete against each other so that was a really that was always a really cool experience uh uh living in in you know living overseas and going to an international school and i think daniel you did um you did track as well right didn't you go to like ISSTs and stuff as well yeah and swimming you know that was the european ISST one. was the european one yeah and i went to yeah. um i went to brussels one year for uh swimming for ISSTs. that's right yeah yeah and it was just like one of those things where I was like, I'm not good enough of a swimmer to travel this far and spend this much money on a tournament <laughs> with all these other people that probably aren't good enough. But it felt like some kind of weird like Olympics, but for, you know, average high schoolers. <laughs> That's a funny way of putting it. But I guess, yeah, it was like, it was a weekend just or three or four days full of sports and games. And that's actually good you know, that's a good question. It brings back a lot of those good memories from from those times because that was kind of like you know, you're in high school, you're just living for the, oh, yeah, I've got to be prepared for the tournament. And yeah, so back then it feels like times. the world. I mean, it's like the biggest thing in the in the world. And yeah, you, like get on a plane and everything. It's it's crazy. Oh, man, I remember <laughs> on Facebook, I had like, oh, this is cringeworthy. Uh, like my Facebook banner was like this, like Nike baseball commercial or something. It was like just total like propaganda. <laughs> it's like, man, I really loved baseball, didn't I? <laughs> Yeah, I forgot how much you love baseball, man. Yeah. Uh, um, it's almost crazy that I don't watch any sports now that I'm like, oh, I'm, I mean, I, I still like baseball and, you know, I'll go play catch or something, but um, it's definitely interesting how interests can kind of sway and change. Yeah, for sure. So who knows what I'll be interested in in 10 years? That's what I'm like curious about. I feel like I'm unpredictable. Well, if you have a consistent interest in learning then y yeah you're right there's no yeah. predictability there it could be anything uh hey so you got married at the at the ripe young age of 24 yeah i was 23 at the time 23 at the time so that's like you know way no, 24 24 you're right so you got you got married like uh, i would say you know Young, younger sure. than average uh yeah so tell us about the girl or the woman that's right the the wifey, she's, of course, she's amazing. That's, you know, that's why I married her. But I, if you had asked me, like, what, what age are you going to get married at? You know, like, what's your prior just to get nerdy? What's your prior on your age that you're going to get married, married at? I would have not, I don't know what the number I would have told you would be, but it was not 24. I was like, probably would have said 28, 29. Um, but, you know, I met her, her name is Sky. I met her, I met Sky in um, my junior year of college. And we actually, like, I already knew who she was um, because she was on the rowing team, actually. She, she's from Canada. And so she was recruited to row um, from the, you know, the rowing coach would go on these recruiting trips, like, to Canada and to, even to Europe and stuff. And he'd kind of find the best high school uh, rowers and he'd recruit them. And so Sky from Dunville, Ontario, you know, Canada, found herself in Tulsa, Oklahoma for rowing. And, you know, here comes me from Athens, Greece, via Cairo, Egypt, in Tulsa. And, um, yeah, just we had, you know, we had mutual friends and she had definitely caught my, my eye. And we, you know, we went out for, for coffee and, like, just from there, we just, like, became, like, instant best friends. And I think that was a huge part of it. It just felt so natural from that very first date we had. And so, um, you know, fast forward two years later, I, I proposed the summer after we graduated. So we graduated that summer. I proposed in, um, in a place that looks similar to this. It was in Milos, not Sadorini. Um, and we actually did, we did two years of long distance, which 
which sucked, but it was again, you know, seeing kind of the, the good aspects of, you know, the, the tough parts was that, uh, we, we both definitely, like we knew from the start going into it, we're like, we knew we were going to get through it and we knew that it was like absolutely worth it to do this long distance and that we were getting married at the end of it. And so we why did long did you distance. Guys, why was the long distance a thing? I had to go start working. That's when I went to the field, um, outside, you know, in Pecos, Texas, and she was starting her master's in speech language pathology. And so it was two years of, of growth for sure. Um, but at the end of it, it was, you know, again, just such a beautiful thing that we could, you know, she graduated, um, she moved here to San Antonio then we got married in Canada. And so, um, yeah, that's where we're at now. And now she works here in, in San Antonio as well. I love it, dude. Yeah. When can we expect little Canadian Greek babies to start running around San Antonio? Not anytime soon, dude. The two <laughs> puppies have been a lot of work. Oh, they're like the, uh, the preview. Sorry. I yeah. had to ask that question on behalf of your parents. So. No, absolutely. Where are the kids? Yanni? come on. What do I think? <laughs> None of my parents sound like that, but you know, that's just, that's the life. Um, so, uh, here's a question. Actually, Paul, do you want to ask the, uh, is this the, is this the question? The question. Yeah. So how old are you, Yanni? I'm 24 turning 25 next week. Oh, this is perfect. Except that well, I, I love the fact that you're married you're, and you're very happy about that. But in this scenario, imagine you're 25. Okay. Not married. Okay. Not even a girlfriend. And you have two choices in front of you. Ooh, okay. You can either join the military. It can mm -hmm. be the Greek military, the American military, but you're going to do it for four years. Ooh. Or every week for six months, you write and deliver your own stand-up comedy material in front of strangers once a week for six months once a week for six months i mean my my, my instinct is to say the the once a week for six months to stand up but that that's a lot of work and i'm probably not funny so this is this i might just have to go with the military just to save myself the embarrassment um but i think the again the push and the challenge of doing stand-up would be really interesting because it's it's one thing to joke around with your friends and it's another to actually have like a, a well thought out plan on how to deliver something that's entertaining and funny. Um, I'm not, I mean, depend, what would I be doing just a standard for like a tour in the military or. Yeah. I mean, you end up uh, going to two or three locations around Greece or around the U S maybe you go overseas, but it's mm. not a dangerous mission kind of thing. It's just, you do you live the military lifestyle. That's, I don't know. Like you said, like that would be an interesting one to consider as well, just because as you know, I grew up overseas and I love to travel. And so I just, any opportunity I have to travel and see new experiences are, you know, are ones that I definitely don't want to miss out on. And so that's, that's, a, that's a good question. It's a tough one. Um, I think it depends on, you know, what my mood would be when I'd answer that question and yeah, how bad I stand up I am to uh, end up going down the military route, probably pretty bad. So military, that's my final answer. Military's final answer. All right. Well, so here's the thing. So the stand-up thing, like you might not be good now, but I guarantee if you worked at it for six months straight, you would be at least pretty funny. I'd hope. You know, I mean, I'm doing a lot of things for six months and I'm still bad at them. So it's like. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Hey, so Yanni, you've lived in Greece, Cairo, and Oklahoma and Texas. We'll put yep. Oklahoma to the side. If you had all the money in the world and you could live in one of those three places, San Antonio, Cairo, or Athens, where would you live and why? I think you said, you know, all the, all the money in the world that definitely does make, make a difference on like the type of lifestyle you'd have. I think, I think I'd have to, I'd, I'd say Athens. Um, I think I'd imagine we're still in this theoretical space of like, you know, what you could possibly do. I think while I don't, no, if I would want to lead, you know, kind of the, the lifestyle that I have here in Athens, I really do like the life. I do like the life that we have here with, you know, being able to to have a house and, and the puppies and the, you know, the backyard and kind of the American dream type thing that you don't really get in Greece. I think it'll be re an interesting experience to, to also live in Greece for a while, especially if uh, the work that I was doing allowed me to kind of have that flexibility and also my family, of course, being there too. That's a big, that's a big one. Um, for Egypt, even though, like I said, I think back very fondly of it, I think 
the best parts is the kind of the memories of the friends and the people that I had um, that made Cairo such a great experience for me. Not that I don't like Cairo. Um, I just think, you know, of, of, of those three places that you mentioned, the one that I would probably want to live in now would be Athens just because I only lived there when I was young. Um, that's not to say that I want, Hey, you know, go live there right now. I wouldn't necessarily want that, but, um, I would definitely, you know, if you, let's say you threw on like a, uh, let's say, I don't know, Singapore or something like I would go to Singapore right now. Um, I just would love the opportunity to just try something new and, and live in a, in a new place that I haven't lived before. So I'm all about the new experiences. Nice. You would choose okay. Athens as well, believe it or not. Yeah. Have you, have you actually visited? I'm, I've never visited, but I, I'm trying to get there in the next couple summers. Yes. Well, you definitely let me know if you do. We'll okay. have a, you know, personal tour guide. I love it. <laughs> with, with the accent and everything, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> this will cost you 10 euro extra a day, though. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, hey, so uh, when you guys were in a band together, was it like a garage band kind of thing, or did you guys... Uh, do shows. Tell me about that. Yeah, you want to take this one, Daniel, or should I? Should I? I mean, yeah, sure. So let's see. It was uh, Battle of the Bands 2010. So I remember we opened that show like pretending we were going to play Hannah Montana. Do you remember that? No. What? We started playing the theme song, like the Hannah Montana theme song, and then like Aaron or Matthew ran in. We're like, no, we're not playing that. And then that's how we started our first song, which was like, "Take Me Out." That's awesome. I totally didn't. That was your idea. Was it really? Yeah, it was your idea. Wow, I'm a genius. So we got second. Genius. We did. So that was the peak, I think, of our success. Another time that Giannis and I played together, which there's actually a YouTube video still, and this is what got me to like reach out to you out of the blue, uh, like maybe a year ago now, was um, our physics teacher, Warren Tappy. Yes. Pulled together like a few random musicians out of the student body and was like, hey, I'm trying to play some uh, Dream Theater, which is a progressive rock band um, or progressive metal. Was, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Progressive rock metal. So anyway, there's this 17 minute song, maybe like 20 minute song called The Count of Tuscany, which is yep. like this really just incredibly beautiful song that has all these yes. different movements and rhythms and parts and and uh Different time signatures and just like all these weird like you know off beats and all these things happening that were just so much fun to play I, I i smile when i think about that that set that we played i know dude and you and like Giannis made a clinic out of you know learning the drums perfectly tyler <laughs> coleman was there at that point and that dude was like a you know prodigious guitar player oh yeah um, he was incredible he played it like i don't even think he practiced until like a week before the set yeah, I don't know how that guy, like... Yeah, he just, like, played. Yeah, he's a phenom on, on the guitar. And then you played bass for that, I remember that. <laughs> I played bass, uh, and, like, I did my best. There were some parts that, woof, man, could not do, but um, a lot John of... John Myung is like, an incredible bassist, so it's, you know... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, w I was not quite there, uh, but that was, so, that was so cool. And there's still a YouTube yeah. video of that, and, like, that song still brings back memories. I love yes. the way that songs, like, put you back into a place. You know what I mean? Whenever I hear the Count of Tuscany, that's like the first thing I remember. Yeah. Okay, cool. So here's a question, Giannis. Go ahead. Um, by the time you're getting ready to retire, what do you want to look back on the trail that you blazed? And, mm. and what do you want to like look back on and be proud of? I think, it, I hope this doesn't sound like a cop-out in terms of an answer, but I think I'll be really proud if I can look back and say that I made an impact in people's lives that I worked with. You know, like I, that essentially I got to help people learn and I got to kind of show them my passion. Like, let's say right now it's, you know, with, with data science and programming, if I can help impact someone else in that way, and then also have an impact with you know, the company that I'm working for and, and feel like I can look back and at something and say, wow, you know, look, I did that. This was really cool. We, we made this solution. Um, regardless of where that's at, I think if I can, have some of those proud moments that I can look back on and say that, you know, I worked hard and I'm proud of the work that I did and I enjoyed all the time that I spent learning and all the things that I uh, worked on. That's, you know, that's where I'd feel proud about what I would have done um, in my, you know, in my career. 
I, I like the dream, you know, I, I like the dream. I think it'd be really cool to perhaps, um, you know, be some kind of a technical lead in something one day, whether that's my own company or whether that's a bigger company or on, on something. I think as long as I'm doing work that I find really interesting and that I'm good at and that I really enjoy doing, I think that would be the perfect combination to, you know, to kind of excel in that role. It's, it's not necessarily, you know, about the prestige and the money. It's, you know, the, you know, yeah, those things are cool, but, um, you know, you'll very quickly see that you, even if you're making a lot of money and you you hate your job, it's, um, it's not worth it. You know what I mean? It's, it's more important to be doing meaningful work that, that you enjoy. So that's kind of what I, if I can continue to do that and grow, I'll be happy. So it's very, it's like very, anything more specific if you want. But. No, no, no. It's like, but it, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's like, it's not about like uh, recognition or fame or renown um, as much as it is just like, it's sort of a private contract between you and the body of work that you engage with. And looking back, you want, you would like to have engaged and worked hard and, you know, in a meaningful way. The, it seems like the motivating factor is just like the work itself. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, the motivator isn't really the money. The money's nice. You know, you can't lie. Of course, it's nice having money and you can do, you know, fun things with it. You can travel, you can do whatever. But uh, like you said, kind of the the personal growth of doing that. And, I, and at the same time, I do think it would be really cool if I could give back to the community in some way in terms of, you know, like, again, to kind of go back to the example with programming, you're familiar with that. It would be really cool to contribute someone to an open source community that, I could say, yeah, you know, yeah, I helped build that. Like that was my contribution and I'm really proud of that because it helped make people's lives a lot better. It made, it helped uh, people enjoy their development experience a lot more, you know, and so on and so forth, whatever that may be. Um, I think that's, you know, that's another part of that, of what I hope to do. Mm. Yeah. And, and open source, like for people that aren't aware, it's like a very, it's a really cool thing to contribute to. And I'm saying this as someone that's never actually contributed to open source. So I'm, I'm being a little bit of a poser, but I, I really admire like the act of uh, working on it because well, open source itself is um, code that's out there in the world, software that's out there in the world that has, has op opened up its source code to the world and said, come help me make it better. And to kind of add a little bit to that too, that it's, it's usually something that's free. Like you can, you know, let's say if we're, if you're on a Windows computer or, or a Mac computer, you typically, you know, you buy the hardware, but you're also paying for the software, the operating system with, you know, one of the most famous open source projects, you know, the Linux Foundation, that's an entire open source, a variety of open source operating systems. And then you've got all types of things that are open for people to contribute to. Um, like right now, it's interesting seeing, especially with some of this, uh, uh, with, the, with the analysis on coronavirus stuff, I think this is where you have the opportunity to make an impact because if you get a ton of people together, uh, especially working on collaborating on an open source project, um, whether that's a variety of, you know, epidemiologists or biochemists, whatever programmers, researchers, if you get something that's open and available to people, you can, you know, work fast and iterate on it and get it out there and ultimately have a, you know, have a big impact on people's lives. I, I kind of think of it in the same space as I think of Wikipedia. Yeah, you that's know, a good like, example. Yeah. It's this community maintained and it's sustained a lot of the time by donations uh, or, you know, it's just straight up volunteers. Free. Yep. Yeah. So it's a, it's a cool thing. So the last couple of questions, uh, Yanni, uh, it sounds like you'll have kids someday. You hope? I think so. Yeah. When the time is right. So the next couple fast, of years, fast forward, I don't know, 40, 50 years, you now have oh. grandkids and they're, they're watching this episode. What advice would you give them? Oh man, that's a tough one. That's, that's a powerful question for sure. I think it, it would really tie into this has probably been the theme of this. So you guys are tired of hearing this, but just find something that you really, really enjoy and, and pursue that as your passion, but also don't let that get in the way of, you know, of family and, and relationships. I think um, one thing that we've talked about a lot in this, at least today have been all these experiences that I have, which were, you know, typically 
career or university driven, the most, some of the most memorable aspects of them were the relationships that I built. So seek to find those meaningful relationships and, and build really good friendships and uh, to continue to kind of foster those uh, over time because it's extremely rewarding, um, you know, to have, to have those, to, those friendships and relationships. That's the best I can do as my 25 year old self. No, that's a great answer, Yanni. Well, um, I know that you have a lot of things that you're doing in your life. So I really appreciate you taking, you know, oh, absolutely. This, this has been uh, an absolute pleasure and I've had a lot of fun talking to you guys. And so really thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Yanni. We really appreciate you coming on, man. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe so you know when our episodes come out. Thanks for listening.